and a friend are looking for a place to live. You have a list of places and go to see a rental agent to check on a number of points. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. The rental on 3rd Street has three bedrooms. So in the example, three bedrooms has been written down in the number of rooms column for 19 3rd Street. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent, and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list? Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello. 
1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr. Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah. We're studying here at university, and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad, and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually, there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot, and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question. But I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here. Nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK. Well, maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now, there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a member of the local council describing plans to redevelop part of the seafront of a coastal town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening, everybody. I wasn't expecting to see so many people. Clearly, this is an issue of great local interest. Thank you all for coming. Well, as you all know, I've come to talk about the Council's plans for redeveloping the western part of the seafront. Firstly, of course, the Queen's Parade shopping centre is to be demolished. It was built on the cheap and in a hurry in 1953 and recently came third in a national newspaper's ugliest buildings in the country list, so I don't think anybody's going to miss it. The question was, what do we replace it with? Well, after consultations with the local community, we decided as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, to replace it with a complex of small shops and workshops, plus a three-screen cinema. We particularly didn't want another bland glass and steel shopping centre full of the same old chain stores as every other town centre. No, this is our chance to do something just a little bit different. I'll start at the top. On the third floor will be a cafe and a restaurant. Part of this will be open air, so people can enjoy a meal or a cup of coffee in the fresh air, weather permitting, of course. Below this will be the cinema, and below that, on the first floor, will be some much-needed council offices. 
We're getting very cramped in the town hall, I can assure you. On the ground floor will be 20 small shop units, ranging in size from 20 to 50 square metres. Also on the ground floor will be five workshop spaces, which we hope will attract small manufacturing businesses back to the town centre, providing some additional local employment. Underneath the centre will be an underground car park, not a great big car park like in the present centre. Our aim is that most visitors to the centre will come on foot or by bus. In fact, the car park will be restricted to people working in the centre and disabled visitors. Then, and perhaps this is the most exciting part of the project, the beach in front of the new complex is going to be completely transformed. We're going to extend the beach. Yes, extend it. 10,000 tonnes of sand is going to be brought in to make it into a proper beach instead of the dirty little strip of sand it is now. As well as being for the enjoyment of local people, we're hoping that a decent beach will attract more visitors to the town and that has to be good for local businesses. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I must emphasise that these plans have not yet been finalised. That's what this meeting is about. Of course, it's vital with a project like this that we have the support of local people. After all, we work for you and it's your money that's paying for it. So, first of all, the plans for the new centre are going to go on display in the Town Hall. They'll be there from Monday the 5th of March until Friday the 6th of April. Uh, plenty of time for anybody who's interested to get over there and have a look at them, I think. There'll be a suggestions box in the same room as the plans. Anybody who has anything to say is welcome to fill in a suggestions form. These forms will be looked at and taken seriously. You can be sure of that. Then on Tuesday, April the 10th, there'll be another public meeting much like this one and in this same place. It'll start at seven o'clock and there'll be a chance for local residents to address the council. We'll also report back to you on the results gathered in the suggestions box. Anyway, I'd now like to hand you over to my colleague, my fellow councillor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. 
I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right, but he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh right, is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down. Did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah, he said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down. I think. Here we are. Yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different. Because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers, social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay, but it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Hear a talk given by Don Parker, an expert on computer security, about the computer criminals. As you listen to the talk, fill in the gaps numbered thirty-one to forty. First, you will have some time to look at the notes below.
Now listen to the talk. Hi there. As an expert on computer security, my job is to oversee and analyze the phenomenon in computer users. Computer has been commonplace in our daily life, make our life and work efficiently and lively. However, with the development of the computer technology, computer crime has come to arise more people's attention. Now, in respect of this topic, I will present some of my view and studies. What kinds of people are perpetrating most of the information technology crime? According to my research, over 80% may be employees. The rest are outside users, hackers and crackers and professional criminals. It is amazing that employees amount for this large portion. Let us see them in detail. Employees. Employees are those with the skills, the knowledge and the access to do bad things. Dishonest or disgruntled employees pose a far greater problem than most people have realized. To most supervisors and some experts, they worry that dishonest employees or outsiders can more easily intercept communications or steal company trade secrets. Workers may use information technology for personal profit or steal hardware or information to sell. They may also use it to seek revenge for real or imagined wrongs such as being passed over for promotion. Sometimes they may use the technology simply to demonstrate to themselves that they have the power over people. This may have been the case with a, a Georgia printing company employee convicted of sabotaging the firm's computer system. As files mysteriously disappeared and the system randomly crashed, other workers became so frustrated and enraged that they quit. Outside users. Suppliers and clients may also gain access to companies' information technology and use it to commit crime. With both, this becomes more a possibility as electronic connections, such as electronic data interchange systems, become commonplace. Hackers and crackers. What are hackers? Hackers are people who gain unauthorized access to computer or telecommunications systems for the challenge or even the principle of it. Crackers also gain unauthorized access to information technology, but do so for malicious purposes. Crackers attempt to break into computers and deliberately obtain information for financial gain, to shut down hardware, pirate software, or destroy data. The tolerance for hackers as the benign explorer has decreased. Most communication systems administrators view any kind of unauthorized access as a threat, and they pursue the offenders vigorously. And educators also try to point out to students that university cannot provide an education for everybody if hacking continues. Professional criminals. Members of organized crime rings don't just steal information technology, they use it in a legal way as a business tool, but for illegal purposes. For instance, Databases can be used to keep track of illegal gambling debts and stolen goods. Drug dealers have used pages as link to customers. Microcomputers, scanners, and printers can be used to forge checks, immigration papers, passports, and driver's licenses. Telecommunications can be used to transfer funds illegally. As information technology crime has become more sophisticated, in 1988, After the last widespread internet break-in, the U.S. Department created the Computer Emergency Response Team, or CERT. Although it has no power to arrest or prosecute, CERT provides round-the-clock international information and security-related support services to users of the internet. Whenever it gets a report of an electronic snooper, whether on the internet or on a corporate email system, CERT stands ready to lend assistance. It counsels the party under attack, helps them thwart the intruder, and evaluates the system afterwards to protect against future break-ins. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.